In this video, we consider the relative reactivities of aldehydes versus ketones. And the result that we're going to derive is that generally, aldehydes are more reactive towards nucleophilic addition than ketones. And there, there are two reasons for this, steric effects and electronic effects. Okay, so what do I mean by steric effects? Well, the ketones have two large groups. They're alkyl groups, so by definition, they're going to be larger than a hydrogen attached to the carbonyl carbon. Therefore, the atom at which the nucleophile has to attack, namely the carbonyl carbon, is more sterically hindered by these bulky R groups, and it is harder for the nucleophile to approach. So, as you can see in the diagram here, the nucleophile approaches the carbonyl carbon. It does not actually approach in between the two R groups, because if it did, it would be even more sterically congested. It approaches from almost perpendicular to the plane of the carbonyl group, but even doing so, if those R groups are large, it's going to cause interference. As you can also see from the diagram, a starting structure that is sp2 hybridized, having only three groups bound to the carbonyl carbon, is replaced by an intermediate structure in which the hybridization is sp3, and there's tetrahedral geometry and four groups bound to what was formerly the carbonyl carbon. Okay, so the increase in congestion at the carbonyl carbon means that sterics are important in this reaction. So the result is that the reactions of ketones are kinetically slower than the reactions of aldehydes are. Okay, what do I mean by electronic effects then? Well, first of all, we have to think back to why carbonyl groups are electrophilic to start with. In other words, why they undergo nucleophilic attack. And there are two reasons for this. There are inductive effects and resonance effects. So inductive effects are simply the fact that the CO pi bond is polarized due to oxygen's greater electronegativity with a partial positive charge on carbon and a partial negative charge on oxygen. The resonance effect, as you might also recall from the first video where I ever talked about the reaction of a car carbonyl group, is that you can draw an alternate resonance structure where there is a positive charge on the carbonyl carbon and a negative charge on the carbonyl oxygen. In other words, you take those two electrons that were the CO pi bond and put them both onto oxygen. This is not a favorable resonance structure, but it does explain the reactivity of carbonyl groups. Well, if you start with a ketone, this alternative resonance structure is a pseudo tertiary oxocarbocation. When I say pseudo oxocarbocation, a true oxocarbocation, the oxygen is neutral and the carbon has a positive charge. In this case, the oxygen is negatively charged and the carbon has a positive charge, thus the term pseudo. But with a ketone, this structure is tertiary, which we like, whereas with an aldehyde, this structure is secondary, which we like less. I'm not going to say we don't like it at all because it is still oxo and it is even better than oxo because the oxygen has a negative charge. Okay, and then depicted in the diagram below is the structure of the carbocation if you started with an aldehyde. So as a result, ketones are actually more thermodynamically stable than aldehyde. And remember that thermodynamically stable means less reactive. So we can look at this on an energy diagram, actually. So formaldehyde, the aldehyde with two hydrogens, which as you could tell would be worse than this reaction, that is higher in energy than an ordinary aldehyde, which is higher in energy than a ketone. The hemiacetal has approximately the same energy. So you can see, first of all, that the energy barrier for the first step of the nucleophilic addition mechanism, you have to get up over that hump, is greater for a ketone than it is for an aldehyde. Okay, secondly, delta G for conversion of a ketone to a hemiacetal 
is positive. Okay, the hemiacetal is higher in energy than the ketone is, so as a result, the equilibrium for this overall reaction lies further to the left. Delta G is approximately zero, as you can see from the diagram, for the conversion of aldehydes to hemiacetals, and delta G is negative, meaning that it's favorable for the conversion of formaldehyde to a hemiacetal. And this behavior, both the steric effects and the electronic effects, are consistent with what we observe physically in the laboratory. So ketones are completely stable. You know, we use acetone as a solvent to wash glass where it will last forever. Many aldehydes go bad on long-term storage. In fact, one of the ways they go bad is they spontaneously oxidize. As you saw, aldehydes can oxidize to carboxylic acids. But another way they can go bad is just to react through nucleophilic addition with adventitious moisture, water, from the air. And formaldehyde, in fact, is supplied as a solution, and what is in the solution is not actually pure formaldehyde itself, but rather the hydrated form where water would be the nucleophile. I can't call it a hemiacetal specifically because it's got two OHs on it. It's simply the hydrated formaldehyde. Okay, so this can help us to explain now in what cases will the carbonyl compound be favored and in what cases will the hemiacetal be favored. In the next video, we will start to discuss hemiacetal formation using option two, making the electrophile more electrophilic.